When I first learned about patinas as a student all those years ago, there was mention of the use of wood chips, drizzling ammonia and or vinegar into wood chips and burying the copper for a good length of time. It was never demonstrated, just mentioned. At the time, I filed it away under interesting, should give it a go, but didn't until now. Reactive materials. I thoroughly mixed one half cup of ammonia with three cups of wood chips. The result, moist but not wet. Then I buried the copper in the wood chip and ammonia mixture and let it cook for four days. And the result, not exactly a big wow, but a very good starting point. And after a bit more thought, I decided to change the ammonia delivery method. Kind of. I thoroughly mixed. Why change the ammonia delivery method? A very good question. First, too much wood chip waste. Really, one third cup per sample is plenty. Second, I thought if I could increase the contact between the copper and the wood chips with a little bit of pressure, as opposed to the first sample where the copper nestled gently in the wood chips, it might affect the color and texture and offer up something more to my liking. So, I thoroughly mixed one teaspoon of ammonia and one third cup of wood chips, made a wood chip copper wood chip sandwich, wrapped it all up tight in plastic wrap, popped it into a Ziploc bag, and let cook for four days. Unwrapped, gently rinsed in warm water, and let dry. And the result is quite a bit different from the original sample and much more to my liking. So I cooked up three more samples. I wanted to see the difference between various degrees of wood chip wetness, assuming of course there would be a difference. So played with the ammonia and left the cook time at a constant four days. I would hazard a guess and say that more ammonia and longer cook times result in more blue and more texture. It would be interesting to see what longer cook times offer up. This is where you come in. If you decide to play with longer cook times, you could share those results with us. In a physical classroom, students learn from each other. This is a very important aspect of education. Since our classroom is a virtual classroom, we created forums for our students to interact and share their experiences. Well, actually, since I don't actually have a website, I should say that if you support my Kickstarter project and register as a first-year student and help me produce the first year of classes, my newly hired website development person will create forums for you to interact and share experiences with your fellow students. At the Creating Linus Introduction to the Ammonia Patina Forum, once built, you'll be able to show and tell us all about your patina adventures, ask for advice, and share your discoveries. And of course, I'll show up from time to time to answer questions, as will my newly hired fellow teachers who will bring their own specialties and skills to your classroom. Imagine the amazing database of jewelry techniques we could build together. I spent a bit of time thinking about how I could use leaves as a reactive material. Actually, first I thought about wood chips and different levels of dampness. I must admit, I do have a preference for the least damp wood chip patina sample compared to the most damp wood chip patina sample. I wanted to know what was the cause of the difference in colors and textures. I think it might have something to do with ammonia fumes versus ammonia liquid since the least damp wood chip patina sample was only dampish with ammonia liquid, there would have been very little, if any, ammonia liquid making direct contact with the copper, and the wood chips might have dried out while the patina was cooking. The patina was likely to have been created primarily by ammonia fumes and dryish wood chips, whereas the most damp wood chip patina sample was very damp and would have had ammonia liquid and damp wood chips sitting directly on top of the copper, as well as more ammonia fumes. Armed with this hypothesis, I decided against soaking the leaves in ammonia. Rather, 
I found an absorbent cloth to act as an ammonia fume delivery method. And I made a leaf copper leaf sandwich, wrapped it in an absorbent cloth, tied with a bit of yarn, drizzled two teaspoons of ammonia, popped into a zip bag, a little squeezy squeezy, and let cook for three days. Soaked in warm water for 20 minutes, carefully removed the cloth and leaf debris, and let dry for 24 hours. The results? Very interesting and definitely very leafy. So I cooked up some more samples. My first impression is a sense of image transference, very reminiscent of old fashioned hand tinted black and white photography. But I get the feeling these patinas could benefit from longer cook times and making sure all the leaves are flat against the copper. I was quite pleased with the results from wrapped, tied, and drizzled, but also felt I should explore more ammonia delivery methods and see what I could come up with. This time I used two different kinds of single leaves, but no clusters, as I felt singles would sit flatter against the copper and form a better imprint. I'll play with clusters later. I soaked a bit of cloth in ammonia, squeezed until damp, and created a cloth leaf copper leaf cloth sandwich, popped it into a zip bag, and let cook for three days, and carefully removed the cloth and leaf debris. And the results? So I'm going to pause right here for a moment. We need to talk about the top and the bottom. This is the bottom, and this is the top. Very different. With some ammonia delivery methods, there will be a marked difference between the top and the bottom. In the case of soaking, squeezing, and covering, this is because the top of the patina would have formed while the reactive material and ammonia were sitting on the copper, whilst the bottom of the patina would have formed with the reactive materials and ammonia sitting under the copper. The patina forming on the top will always have gravity working for it, whereas the patina forming on the bottom will always have gravity working against it. Couldn't you just flip the patina over every once in a while? So they cook equally on both sides? Absolutely. Flipping the patina while it's forming will have an effect of some kind and might even equal out the size. But flipping the patina could also move the leaf about, which could affect how the leaf image forms. I decided not to flip during this set of samples, but it is something I will have a closer look at in the future. Let's have a look at wrapped, tied, and drizzled versus dipped, squeezed, and covered. Well, there would appear to be a difference between wrapping, tying, and drizzling and dipping, squeezing, and covering. Something to keep in mind. I set up a fume chamber and place the leaf flat against the copper. I know from experience that a flat leaf forms a better impression. Then I sprayed an ammonia salt solution. Why the different spray bottle? Because I was going to be playing with so many different solutions, I purchased my spray bottles by the case from a local packaging company. But I thought I should also try a more commonly found spray bottle, which I found at my local dollar store for a dollar. About halfway through cooking, I decided there was too much ammonia salt solution and used a bit of paper towel to draw off some of the liquid. Why? Turns out the larger spray bottle sprays more liquid. From experience, I know that a wet patina will dry lighter and can be more fragile. I made a judgment call and removed some of the liquid, hoping the patina would be darker and more stable. And I think I made the right decision because once cleaned and dry, I really like this patina. Clearly, different leaves and different ammonia delivery methods will offer up different effects. Wait a minute, what's the patina in the corner? You never showed us that one, didn't I? No. Nope. Oh, <laughs> silly me. One day, my mum was cooking up some beet leaves. I thought, why not? So I cooked up a sample. Clearly, different leaves and different ammonia delivery methods will offer up different effects. I was really lazy for a couple of weeks and did not cut the grass which resulted in some really long grass. Perfect for making patinas. 
So I wrapped the grass around a bit of copper, then wrapped it all up in cloth, drizzled three teaspoons of ammonia, popped into a zip bag, a little squeezy squeezy, and cooked for three days. After soaking in warm water, I removed the grass debris, and the result? What lovely, dynamic movement. There's a lot of energy in the blending of blues and greens, and the lines created by the long grass. So I cooked up three more samples. There's something almost painterly about these patinas, with layers of color and quick, decisive brush strokes. Who knew wood chips, leaves, and grass could offer up such wonderful patinas?